Okay, great. So it's a pleasure to introduce today uh, Rona Strawbridge, uh, who works at, is a research fellow at the University of Glasgow. Uh, she works at the Institute for Health and Wellbeing, and she currently speaks to us today from her from her flat in Glasgow, I believe. So she's going to speak to us today about the relationship between um, uh, cardiovascular disease and major mental illness or mental illness and, and why those things seem to occur more commonly than by the play of chance alone. Uh, if you want to ask questions either through her talk or at the end, if you type your question into the Q&A box, what I usually do, unless you ask me not to, is I will then give you the opportunity to ask the question yourself by adding you to the, the delegates and I'll then remove you again afterwards. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and I will, I will copy you into the, the, the call at the end when there'll be a moment to actually deliver your question yourself. So without, without further ado, uh, Rhoda, um, welcome and thanks very much for coming to speak to us today. Thank you very much. I will put up the presentation so hopefully you can see it. Ooh, starting at the beginning might be a good call. There we go. Yes, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today about some of the work I'm currently doing or have recently done. Um, as Andrew said, I am based in Glasgow. Um, a little bit about where I come from and how I got to where I am. I started off by doing a PhD on prostate cancer and type 2 diabetes back in the days when studying a small number of SNPs and a couple of hundred people was the norm. I then moved on to genome-wide association studies of cardiometabolic disease, working with the International Genetics Consortia, before moving on to trying to use that information to assess causality of certain biomarkers on cardiovascular disease. I then moved to Glasgow to start looking at mental illness, specifically mood disorders and endophenotypes, before getting a fellowship to look at, to combine my backgrounds, uh, to look at why people with severe mental illness have higher rates of cardiometabolic disease. So I'll start off by acknowledging all the people involved in the studies I've worked with, because without them it wouldn't be possible. Similarly, my colleagues, collaborators and my funding. So what am I interested in? Instead of uh, looking just at diagnoses, which is, has been quite a traditional approach, both for severe mental illness and cardiometabolic disease, I'm more interested in the endophenotypes. This has been done a lot more with cardiometabolic disease, so studying things like lipid levels to inform uh, more about the biology of cardiovascular disease. Um, severe mental illness is starting to catch up with the RDOC uh, criteria and trying to look more at traits that span the entire population, not just those with diagnoses. Um, and then trying to combine all of this information to understand why cardiometabolic disease, CMD, is more common in those with serious mental illness, which I abbreviate to SMI. So the first thing we've been looking at is an endophenotype for severe mental illness, specifically suicidality. So suicidality encompasses a broad range of thoughts and experiences and behaviours. It's a common feature of many psychiatric diagnoses, but it also occurs out with psychiatric diagnoses. There are heritability estimates that are substantial, suggesting that it is amenable to genetic study. Genetic studies of suicidal behavior to date have mainly been limited to attempted suicide and death by suicide, but predominantly within those with psychiatric diagnoses. This has um, differences in recruitment criteria and diagnoses mean that to date, genetic findings for suicidal behavior have not been replicable, which has been a, a major limitation of driving the field forward. So in contrast to that, we would like to, or we decided to look at suicidality as a spectrum of behaviors, shown in the arrow here. Um, basically, from, from one side of no suicidality aligned in order of increasing severity. This is across the whole population, in the general population sample, for, sorry. Um, and we do acknowledge there are some caveats with this study. The model we're using is rather simplistic. We are aware that people will fluctuate between hour to hour. However, we've got to start somewhere. So this is yeah, a starting point. 
Similarly, we appreciate that self-harm may or may not be a distinct entity from suicidal behavior. However, because it is a big risk factor for future suicide attempt, we kept it in this model. So using the UK Biobank study, which for anyone who's not aware of it, it's about half a million individuals who were recruited from across the UK who filled in very detailed and extensive questionnaires about lifestyle, uh, medical history, anything you can imagine, incredible amounts of data. And there was a baseline assessment uh, to gain more anthropometric measures and clinical, more detailed clinical information. Approximately five years after the study started, or after baseline recruitment, a, a more detailed thoughts and feelings questionnaire was sent out to a subset of the cohort. So within this, there was assessment of suicidal behavior, including no suicidality, so those who reported no thoughts or feelings of suicidal behavior. And then the next categories were ordered by increasing severity. So they were sequentially asked questions. So people were classified into the most serious category or most severe category of behavior. And so each category is non-overlapping and they were considered in an ordinal fashion. We were able to identify those who died by suicide, um, but they were not included in the primary analyses. So we looked at genetic variants across the whole genome for association with suicidal behavior, and these are our results. Here we have a, a smaller plot, shows the quality control. It shows we don't have any major issues, which is good. And then we have the Manhattan plot, each dot represents a genetic variant aligned along the X axis by their position on the chromosome. The association with suicidal behavior is on the Y axis, log transformed, so the higher up it is, the more strongly associated, the more interesting we find it. The dotted red line indicates our threshold for significance. And as you can see, we had three, uh, three loci reaching significance. If we zoom into these loci, we see that in this locus, we have lots of different genetic uh, genes underlying the locus. We don't know which one is the, the, the causal gene or which gene is um, the genetic variant is acting through. And none of them have any particular biology that helps to identify this. So more work would be needed to understand that locus. On this locus over here, we have not very many SNPs. It's not a very solid signal. And the two genes in the region have unknown function. So also that's hard to understand how the variants are having their effect. This locus has only one gene and it has previously been associated with traits such as neuroticism and other behavioral phenotypes. That's actually a good candidate gene and um, I'm, I have future projects exploring better how that might be acting. So that's one really cool study looking at an endophenotype for cardiometabolic, uh, sorry, for psychiatric disease. Moving on to endophenotypes for cardiometabolic disease, we know that adipose tissue is very important. Specifically, lipid storage and release is key to energy balance. Whether energy or the lipids are stored in many small cells, a hyperplastic adipose tissue, or few large cells, which is hypertrophic adipose tissue, has a very important determinant on how metabolically healthy you are. Many small cells are good, few large cells are bad, to simplify it. Um, and there are correlations between hypertrophy and circulating lipid levels, so high LDL, high triglycerides, not very good cardiometabolic phenotype, insulin resistance, and also inflammation. So adipose tissue not only stores and releases lipids, but it also produces a lot of inflammatory markers. Um, and the more hypertrophic uh, the, the adipose tissue is, the more it's releasing pro-inflammatory uh, markers. So to study this, we looked at the genial cohort, which is a group of individuals who were recruited from an obesity clinic in Stockholm. They're all white European ancestry. There are 940 some adipose tissue biopsies were taken and very detailed phenotyping of these adipose tissue biopsies has been conducted. 
For this study, we were specifically looking at whether the tissue was hyperplastic or hypertrophic. There's also a fair amount of clinical data for these individuals, and there's genome-wide genotyping. Um, 940 is a pretty small study for a genetic study. It's a very small sample. However, I hope to show you that with adequate or appropriate follow-up studies, it still can be quite useful. A brief overview of the cohort. They are predominantly women and predominantly over, uh, obese, sorry. And the non-obese are, <laughs> to a large degree, quite overweight. Um, no, that's not true, sorry. I apologize. They're actually on the borderline of overweight. Anyway, with that in mind, we looked at the genome-wide genotyping for associations with um, adipose morphology, so hypertrophic or hyper versus hyperplastic. Uh, phenotyping. And here we see again the quality control plot shows that we have no issues, that's good. We see one signal that just about reaches uh, our threshold for significance. There is one gene in this region, it is not expressed in immature or mature adipose uh, tissue, which makes it a pretty hard uh, gene to study in adipose. We then started looking at the potentially significant or suggestive significant signals. So the general logic is if you had a much bigger sample size, these signals might then become significant. And it may be there is a true signal there, but the sample size is a bit too small for it to be significant. So we looked at the signals here that have multiple genetic variants that are above the threshold for suggestive significance. If we zoom in to two of these loci, again, we see lots of genes under the signals. And we looked at whether or not these genes were expressed in adipose tissue, either in immature adipocytes or in the mature adipocytes. The ones that are highlighted, the ones that are circled, were expressed. The others were non-detectable, so we couldn't study them. Then we looked at what happens if you remove these genes from the adipocytes. So you culture the adipo adipocytes, you treat them to knock out each gene set one at a time and see what effect it has on lipid accumulation. So here we see if we knock out these genes compared to the negative control, the amount of lipid being accumulated in the cells drops. At the same time, compared to the negative control, expression of proliferation markers increases. So by knocking out these genes, we're pushing the adipose tissue to a smaller droplet size so that um, there will be, it's more hyperplastic, there are more cells, but each one is smaller. So that's, that's a quite elegant way, I think, of um, using a genetic study that's a bit small, but with decent follow-up studies to, to actually explore the biology. So then moving on to the main point of this, of my talk. Um, well, we, we know from epidemiology that those with severe mental illness have increased risk of cardiometabolic disease. We know that risk factors for cardiometabolic disease are increased in those with severe mental illness. So sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, substance use, um, socioeconomic factors. We also know that antipsychotic medication has a pro-cardiometabolic um, effect. However, there is growing evidence that there might be common biology. So the same biological mechanisms underlie both severe mental illness and cardiometabolic disease. But as yet, we don't really know which mechanisms they are. If we can identify the mechanisms, and if they're already being targeted by drugs to treat cardiometabolic disease, maybe they can be repurposed to treat symptoms of serious mental illness and prevent the longer term cardiometabolic disease in this vulnerable population. So the way I'm looking at this is using firstly candidate gene studies because increasingly we find genetic loci for psychiatric traits that overlap with genetic loci for cardiometabolic traits. So by looking at, when you look at the two studies, so for example, the psychiatric genetics consortium present this locus for the psychiatric disease and then the cardiometabolic uh, 
consortia present a, a locus, it's very hard to compare those two studies to see whether or not the signal is the same. Population differences, lack of individual level data, it, it's complicated, it's not easy to compare. By looking at a candidate gene study, systematically assessing all of the variants in that locus for a variety of psychiatric and cardiometabolic traits within the same population, we might be able to um, identify which signals are affecting which traits and distinguish whether or not the same signal is affecting the different types of illness or whether it's distinct loci, uh, distinct, distinct signals that happen to be having different actions, but within the same gene region. We can also use genome-wide or larger scale methods such as genetic correlation and polygenic risk scores. And I have a little bit of a new method that I think is pretty cool uh, to look into this as well. So candidate gene studies. So this is one example. CADM2 is a locus that's been associated with BMI and fat mass. It's also been associated with a variety of cognitive and behavioral traits. Um, so we looked at this genetic locus in four different cohorts, a variety of different cardiometabolic traits. So the purpose of using four cohorts was to look more at generalizability. UK Biobank is great and it is huge, which is fantastic, but it is still only um, British or predominantly British. Uh, by using a bunch of other cohorts as well that are pan-European, we were able to then look at whether or not these signals are generalizable to a wider European population. It has its pros and cons, but yeah, this is what we did for this study. So for each study, we analyzed each trait in each cohort and then combined the cohorts in an inverse variance fixed effect meta-analysis. And what we found was this. So here we have genetic variants associated with um, the, the various traits. The plot demonstrates how often two variants are co-inherited. The number is essentially a percentage with a darker color being um, a higher percentage and white being the lowest possible percentage. So here we can see that the genetic loci, uh, lead SNP, the lead variant for neuroticism and that for mood instability are co-inherited all the time. That says that that information is the same genetic information for both traits, it's the same signal, it's the same genetic effect essentially. In contrast, there is very little co-inheritance with any of the other traits. So this information suggests that within the CADM2 locus, there are different genetic signals affecting different pathways which have different effects on the different traits. So this would argue that there really isn't common biology. However, that's not the full story because if we start to look into how the genetic variant might have its effect on the trait, specifically by looking at expression levels of the gene, we can see that unsurprisingly, the genetic variant for BMI affects CADM2 expression levels in adipose tissue. That's, that's not surprising, that's what we expected. But what is surprising is that the genetic loci, uh, sorry, the genetic variants for the psychological traits are also affecting expression levels of this gene in adipose tissue, which is suggesting that actually the genetic variants might be independent, but the effects they're having are similar. So this is, I think, the first, poss possibly the first demonstration of one locus that's affecting metabolic and psychiatric traits through unknown mechanisms but the same locus having these diverse effects and the first possible explanation for a mechanism between the psychiatric traits and BMI. Wanting to go further with this study I, start, I went back to the genial cohort to look at whether or not CADM2 um, levels are expressed and look for expression in that cohort uh, look at the phenotyping. However, <laughs> unfortunately, CADM2 is not detectable in those samples. I can still go back and look at the genetic variants and have a look at their effects on the phenotypes, so lipid storage morphology, for example, um, but it was not as easy as I was hoping it would be. So more work on CADM2 is, is ongoing. Then looking at genome-wide methods, 
sorry, just a second. So we can use genetic correlations to assess across the whole genome how similar are the effects of genetic variants on trait one compared to on trait two. This has been done to some degree, comparing psychiatric traits with cardiometabolic traits. However, the focus has predominantly been on diagnostic traits, for psych particularly for psychiatric illness. So this study um, was very good and it looked at uh, schizophrenia and OCD and bipolar disorder, rather than the, whereas I'm more interested in the endophenotypes. Another thing to notice is the first time that uh, this has been done in a sex-specific manner. It's unclear at the moment, to my knowledge, I might be wrong, um, to what extent there are sex differences in psychiatric illness. However, when you're looking at cardiometabolic traits, there are very, very clear and well-reported differences. So it's very important to have the sex stratified angle and not group men and women together. Um, so my, one of my aims is to look at this more, but looking at uh, endophenotypes rather than diagnostic criteria. So here we're looking at on phenotype one, we have psychiatric endophenotypes and phenotype two, we have cardiometabolic uh, outputs, sorry, traits. Um, these, the phenotype one, the psychiatric illness endophenotypes are conducted in UK Biobank. These studies use the summary statistics of the giant uh, magic diagram consortia output. So they are the results that do not include UK Biobank. So there's no overlap in samples. So some of this is unsurprising. We are, it has been reported before that risk taking and BMI are correlated. It's maybe not a surprise that chronic pain and BMI are correlated. There is some possibility of reverse causality or circular logic whereby if you experience chronic pain, you might be more sedentary. It might be that your diet is poor or the diet is or food is the most exciting thing you have going. So you overeat compared to the exercise and, and put on weight. So in some respects, this is not surprising. However, this kind of logic about behavior influencing um, gain of weight does not explain things like waist hip ratio adjusted for BMI, which is specifically central adiposity rather than total adiposity. Why would, um, why would people who experience chronic pain accumulate more fat centrally compared to somebody who doesn't have chronic pain but the same BMI? So these are very complicated questions. Similarly, intermedia thickness is a measure of vascular remodeling. How chronic pain would influence behavior that would then cause that is even less clear because it's a very complex phenotype that involves not just um, lipids, but uh, inflammation and <laughs> sheer stress and so many different processes. So I think this is starting to show that there really is a good, there is something interesting going on here, quite what it means or how, that's a, <laughs> a good question. Another thing to note from this is that there were no associations with blood pressure, which is surprising because when looking at diagno diagnoses of psychiatric illness compared to diagnoses or cardiometabolic phenotypes, blood pressure is one of the most strongly associated, particularly with bipolar disorder, you see associations with systolic blood pressure quite a bit. So that's surprising. Again, I have to redo this using sex-specific analysis, but there is something, or potentially something quite interesting there. So then the last project I want to talk to you about, this is one of my babies. Um, can we use the genetics of severe mental illness and cardiometabolic disease to group people into in different subsets? So if we start off, this is the one time I will propose using diagno diagnoses rather than endophenotypes purely for practical reasons. When I started this project, the, there were fewer endophenotype results published. Schizophrenia was the biggest psychiatric um, GWAS available, so that's where I started, and it went on from there. So if we identify the loci for schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar, 
And then we find the genetic loci for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and all the endophenotypes there. And then we look at, at this in, firstly, the improved cohort. This is 3,400 individuals with high cardiovascular risk. Uh, severe mental illness was an exclusion criteria, so there are no individuals with either schizophrenia, depression, or bipolar in that cohort. They were recruited from seven centers in five European countries, so a pan-Europe study. For validation of the method, we looked at one subset of UK Biobank. Um, from the preliminary imaging data, it's a general population sample, and then we replicated the study in a larger sample of UK Biobank, again, the imaging data um, cohort. So we selected the genetic loci, we excluded rare variants. Many genetic variants are co-inherited in the block. That made it um, more computationally heavy. So instead of using all of the genetic variants in each block, we picked one genetic variant from each block, and then we ran principal components analyses. Then we plotted the principal components. So in these plots, each dot is an individual, and by plotting the first two components, this is showing how closely related each individual is to each other individual. So for schizophrenia, we see three groups. For depression, we don't really see any particular pattern. For bipolar and the overlap with cardiometabolic disease, we kind of see three groups, but they're not very well separated. Whereas for schizophrenia, there is actually some separation between the groups. Because this is a multi-center study, we obviously started checking whether or not the center or the latitude or the country was driving this grouping, and it's not. Um, nor is it being driven by the genetic variants with strong effects on cardiovascular disease. To date, we, do not know, we have not found any systematic bias of why this is happening, which is cool. So then we tried to repeat the method in UK Biobank. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, we looked at the clinical differences between the three groups. Group two has the lowest rate of diabetes, quite interesting. Group three has the lowest rates of hypertension, the least vascular remodeling, and yet the highest rate of smoking, which is counterintuitive. So that's interesting, that's the first study. Can we repeat the method? Uh, so using the smaller set of UK Biobank, yes, we can. We can get a nice separation. I will point out that I have cleaned a few individuals from between the groups so that the groups are more clearly defined. But that was only a handful of individuals. So we get similar grouping using the same method. And this cohort does have some individuals with bipolar, depression, or generalized anxiety, but they're not driving the clustering either. There are individuals with each of these diagnoses in each of the groups. So there's no particular pattern. So then does this stand up in the larger group from UK Biobank? And the answer is yes. We still see three nice groups. Here we also see actually some groups in between. However, this only accounts for 7% of the population sampled. So that's maybe not too bad. In contrast to the previous um, sample from UK Biobank, we do see that this grouping is overrepresented in uh, with people with depression. However, that's maybe maybe that's not unexpected. <laughs> um, maybe that's not a problem for this. I'm not sure. Just that it's a fact. We still do see differences between uh, the groups in terms of systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. For example, this group, the middle group, has the, the lower rate of type 2 diabetes, the same, which is comparable with the, the results from IMPROVE. However, the, the group with the lowest blood pressure has switched from being the smallest group to the largest group. So the, the groups are hard to translate between different populations. However, the method for clustering is quite robust between and seems to work reasonably well um, between different studies. And as another way of checking to see we actually have something real here, if you repeat the method using all of the genetic variants in the schizophrenia loci, not only those that are 
overlapping with cardiometabolic disease, we see this and no particular pattern at all. So there is something special with schizophrenia and cardiometabolic disease loci overlap and something that's, we believe there is something quite uh, interesting going on here. Whether or not it's clinically useful is another question. I presented this work to my clinical colleagues in Karolinska, a bunch of cardiologists who said, yeah, that's fine, but the differences between the groups are so small, it's not clinically meaningful. Um, the differences were bigger in an improved study compared to UK Biobank. Maybe that's not a surprise given that UK Biobank is a general population cohort that is on the healthy end of the spectrum, whereas UK Bi uh, Improve, sorry, is a high risk cohort. So whether it has meaning um, is still up for discussion. So what else am I doing? I would like to continue with this, uh, looking more at the genetic correlations of the endophenotypes, particularly considering the different sex effects, and then maybe extend this to also looking at causal effects. It could be that for some, for some loci or for some conditions, behavioral traits are driving the associations such as increased BMI or because, uh, risk takers maybe smoke more, having a knock-on effect of cardiovascular disease. But it might also be that there are combined effects or the opposite to what we expect. Basically, we want to know as much as possible to see how we can use it or modulate it. Also, there are a bunch of methods saying that, that uh, suggest if you consider related phenotypes together, maybe we find something more interesting. Um, Multivariable Mendelian randomization, for example, that's um, a fairly recently developed method whereby if you combine, we know that schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar all show this increased rate of cardiometabolic disease. If we consider all of the genetic loci with all three of those traits together, even if there are overlap, maybe we can find something more useful than if we just look at each trait individually. Um, also trying to explore the clinical utility of the, the method for grouping the individuals. That's something I'm very keen on looking into. How best to do that? Which is the best data set? I'm still going around in circles <laughs> with the, the different possibilities. So any suggestions? I'm, I'm very happy to hear about them. Um, candidate loci. So CNTN5, the locus we identified for suicidality, has also been associated with BMI and waist hip ratio. So we're looking into that systematically to see what's going on in terms of overlap or not um, is interesting. Another candidate loci is um, the major histocompatibility complex region or the HLA region. It's the strongest genetic predictor for most psychiatric diagnoses and yes, it's, ignor it's ignored to a great extent because it's complicated, but maybe we should be looking at that in greater detail. So that's something to look at. Suicidality doesn't fit so well within the rest of my <laughs> research program because it doesn't overlap to the same, at least on the whole genome level, um, with cardiometabolic traits. However, I'm still very interested in it. UK Biobank is good, but because it's collected in from middle-aged people or older, there's a huge survival bias. Maybe if we look at adolescence or particularly adolescence with longitudinal data, maybe we can find some more, uh, some more genetic loci that influence suicidality and particularly stronger effects. In addition, uh, prediction models for suicide attempts or death typically, to my knowledge, um, are focused on asking questions about how people are feeling at that point in time. Those responses can vary from hour to hour, day to day. If we add genetics, which are a static risk factor, so genetic risk for suicidality, can that improve suicide prediction models? So that's some of the stuff that I'm thinking about and trying to work on. And thank you for your attention. And I'm always happy to talk about these things. So if you have any comments or questions now or later, please get in touch. Thank you. If you could sh stop sharing your screen for a second, uh, Rona, and uh, uh, so th thanks very much for, for a very clear talk. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I want to ask people now to think about questions and to write them in the, 
the Q and A box, which I've got in front of my screen at the moment. Um, I guess there's, uh, I, I've uh, had, had the pleasure of hearing your talk before and, and, uh, and being able to kind of digest some of the things that you've said. And I think that the, um, that's a really intriguing plot, isn't it? The, the separation into three groups and then into seven groups. And uh, I think your colleagues at Karolinska who, who thought the effect sizes were, were too small are probably not used to doing much work in psychiatry where, where that seems to be like an, a, a sort of very large effect size where you see clear space between each of the groups. I was wondering to what extent those, uh, those traits are geographically clustered. So in, in some previous papers, work from Bristol and from Peter Vischer, showing that there's clustering of multidimensional components uh, and clustering of polygenic risk scores according to geography. Is it, is it uh, I know that you, you may not have done it, but is it possible to, to look at that in, in the data sets that you have? We did look at, um at say latitude and the first clustering from the improved cohort because it was such beautifully clusters I was like I must have done something wrong so it's probably center driving this or latitude and actually that wasn't the case um, there is geographical clustering within improve of certain specific traits of cardiometabolic disease are more common in the Scandinavians compared to the Mediterranean uh, cohort how that is driving the cluster, I have tried to look, but because, because there is no effect of, if you plot, if you do those plots and then color the individuals by center or latitude, there's no obvious pattern. So I don't think that is driving it. Um, I think it does seem to be, I'm not sure what. <laughs> um, that doesn't fully answer your question and I will have to look into the papers about the geographical clustering of polygenic risk scores to fully understand how that might be driving it. But all of the quality control I've been doing to prove I haven't messed up or there's no systematic bias has shown that that is not the answer. Um, I had some excellent feedback from some people in Kings recently, which may or may not have killed or their suggestions. It took me a few days to get to because I was like, if he's right, this is going to kill off that project. But he wasn't right. So the project's still going. Um, Good myself and the people I've spoken to have yet to identify a reason that it's not a true biological effect. Yeah actually I think even if it had been geographically clustered I don't think it would necessarily uh, kill the effect because cardiovascular disease varies greatly doesn't it in its distribution yeah. and it might reveal something important about the, the underlying risk factors. So we, we don't have any questions yet so uh, please do oh we do good 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 so um, so Mark Adams, I'm going to, Mark, I'm going to, um, I'm going to add you to the call uh, so you can ask your own question. So just give me a second to do that. I will get, I will get slicker at this as time goes on. Mark, that's you. You're muted at the moment, but you're, you're live. Oh yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering if you looked at the uh, like MHC region or maybe a SNP that's tagging like a big structural um, variant like chromosome 8 inversion or something? So the, the genetic variants that were used to, so in, in IMPROVE, um, there is not genome-wide genotyping. Uh, there is only cardiometabolic and immunochip genotyping. So structural variants were not well covered. So structural variants are not part of it, unfortunately. The, HM, uh, the HLA region, however, is very well covered using the, um, the immunochip. And so actually the, the HLA region is in there. It's not, I mean, a lot of studies do ignore it, but we haven't. We've included the HLA region in there, which was almost surprising that it still works when you compare across Europe um, and with, within the UK, because you would expect the HLA region to vary a lot more. So when you're filtering for SNPs, for example, the ones that are rare are going to be different between different populations and the LD pattern. So how many you keep is going to be a bit different. Um, so the HLA region is in there. Something that occurred to me today um, when I was preparing this talk was that actually maybe it's worth trying to do this with only the HLA region and see if it's the HLA region variation that's causing something here. Oh yeah, I guess my other suggestion for that would be to um, look at the eigenvectors to see what SNPs are driving 
um, those two comp that that first uh, component. So I have, see, yes. I have tried doing a little bit of that. I can definitely, I definitely need to do more. But my first quick and dirty effort at identifying the genetic variants driving this did not produce anything in particular. I was hoping it might be able to narrow it down to say 10 SNPs instead of 300 odd. But no, it just came back with another list of almost complete list of SNPs. Does that answer your question? <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So um, do, do, just do one other brief speculation, uh, Roger, was do you think that there'll be a, are you going to concentrate on using genetics to tease apart the links between these two sets of disorders, mental health on the one hand and cardiovascular disease on the other? Uh, or do you think that there'll be a role for using other omics, uh, particularly as many of the manifestations of cardiovascular disease are peripheral and possibly measurable from blood? Absolutely. I think uh, genetics alone won't provide all the answers. For example, with the CADM2 locus, just looking at the genetics said it was very separate, but then adding in transcriptomics said actually, no, there is there's something more going on here. So I think genetics is an interesting way of narrowing down some of the options and getting a bit of understanding of what's going on underneath different traits. But absolutely, you need to, genetics is never going to solve everything on its own. You need to add all the different types of data and try and triangulate to, to something. <laughs> And it was actually a very a, a, a subtle plug of the Generation Scotland data if you ever wanted to use that because there are 10,000 10, people there with uh, peripheral DNA methylation so that, that might be something interesting to talk about sometime. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, anybody else any questions? I'm sorry if I confused anybody by speaking too fast. I normally do that. I try and slow down and fail dismally. Um, if you have questions later, feel free to contact me and let me know. That's, that's a very generous offer. Uh, I think that, that people may well uh, reach out to you later or they may go, go and have a look at the presentation later on YouTube and come back to you afterwards after they've had a chance to think about it. Oh, uh, no, uh, sorry, that's a, not a question, that's a compliment. So uh, popping up in the chat box. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks very much for coming and giving us a talk. And, uh, You'll live on uh, uh, perpetually in cyberspace, also. So, uh, what a scary <laughs> thing. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. That's that was very clear, and uh, I'll stop recording now. But uh, cheerio, everybody, and thanks. thanks for the questions. Cheers. Bye bye.